G'day mate, Matty Graham here. Welcome to episode 59 of the Exponential Performance Podcast. In this episode, I sit down with endurance athlete and coach Dougal Allen to talk all things endurance related. I feel honoured to call Dougal a friend and we went through university together and in this episode we chew the fat right from the beginning of his racing career all the way through to his professional days now. In the little outtakes video I released earlier in the week about this interview there was a lot of quick fire questions, a lot of goofing around, a lot of laughs, a lot of people said that they were super excited for this episode. Now I hope it doesn't disappoint because unfortunately the outtakes video, well it kind of gets a little bit serious from there and we actually dive into some uh, stuff about training and nutrition so hopefully you enjoy that uh, as well as those outtakes that were a bit of a laugh. Anyway, sit back, relax, I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I did sitting down and catching up with Dougal and recording it. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Exponential Performance Podcast. Join sports scientist and performance coach Matty Graham to find out how to train smarter and maximize your performance no matter who you are. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come, the time everybody has been waiting for. In the red corner, standing at 185 centimetres, quite big for an endurance athlete, but wait for it, 80 kilos is the man, the myth, the legend himself, Dougal Allen, endurance athlete and coach. Mate, it's good to have you here. Why do you say coach with such a big smile, mate? Are you still... Finding it funny that I'm a coach. My arms are so stoked that you are, and uh, <laughs> and to have you here. To be honest, I'm most pleased that uh, I was finally able to negotiate a reasonable appearance fee with your uh, with your agent to get you on the in, you know get you here for an interview after all of these years. But it happened. She, dri- she drives a hard bargain, Amy. Eh? <laughs> she sure does, mate. She sure does. How you doing anyway? Good, mate. Long time listener, first time caller, so it's a pleasure, obviously, to um, step step on board, fill uh, the big shoes of Mr. Nick, and um, try and, you know, relay some smack back in your direction. We seem to get enough of it dished out in our direction from you, so... There'll be plenty of it. There'll be plenty of it. Um, first major questions, I guess, all the important ones. One, have you trained this morning, and what was it? Uh yeah, 8K jog, that was about it really. I've um, I've had a dicky soleus muscle that's been, um, you know, just sort of telling me to, to not expect to step back into the same sort of level of training I had going pre-coast to coast. So it's funny mm-hmm. how the body sends its little warning signs at you. And um, yeah, so just a nice easy 8K run, pain-free, so pretty pleased. Perfect. Uh, and I guess number two, what was the coffee order this morning? I saw the uh, Instagram post of the machine going. Is that the new one? Is that the new coffee that's, machine? or is that's, That is literally the first pour it's ever had this morning. Is so it? It was, um, well, yeah. Um, what was my coffee? There were three of them. Um, one was a long black. One was a long black with a bit of cream. <laughs> and uh, one was a disaster. I tried to experiment with a bit of milk. So, uh, yeah, we'll call that one a a flat white but it wasn't really <laughs> fantastic mate all right we're going to jump straight into what i'm calling the quick fire round so this here is a combination of questions from uh, social media that that came through but then also i've slotted in a couple of other ones as well but uh just keep in mind that a quick game's a good game and we're looking <laughs> for short answers uh just whatever pops into your mind so for example, the question might be mountains or ocean, and you'd say? Ocean. Ocean. There you go. Excellent. All right, so are you ready? Quick fire, just to get you loosened up before we get into the heavy stuff. I'm ready. Texting or talking? Texting. If you were a superhero, who would you be? Spider-Man. Why Spider-Man? Flynn's favorite superhero. Boom. Hardest race you've ever done? The Gold Rush. Why? Uh, just, yeah, hot, 
hilly and just full on really sums it up scale of one to ten how good of a driver are you two and a half (laughs) (laughs) if you weren't doing what you're doing now what job slash career would you like to do uh long haul pilot oh good is double dipping chamois cream acceptable absolutely if it's someone else's not your own though yeah and as long as you're not using it for lip balm at the same time (laughs) fill in the blank taylor swift is my former hero you're going to go out on an adventure and you can only take one snack what is it ginger ale cliff blocks oh god uh where are we up to what is your middle name larkin make a high-pitched sound sound good one to ten how hot do you like your shower water oh um probably eight and eight that's up there. Um, big spoon or little spoon? <laughs> Have you seen how tall my wife is? <laughs> hey, man. Definitely big spoon. Has well, to that's, be. not, that's not the way it worked that one time. <laughs> You're bigger than me. Kim, Card- <laughs> Kim Kardashian <laughs> and Donald Trump are both drowning at the same time in, your, in the Moana pool when you used to be a lifeguard. Sorry. At the Wanaka pool when you used to be a lifeguard. Who do you save first? Probably go and take a smoker. <laughs> good, good. So that's, I guess that kind of sets the tone for the upcoming interview. Yeah, that's good. You've loosened me up. I'm relaxed. Good. My shoulders are feeling good. Excellent. So let's, uh, let's take it right back to the start. Where did it all begin for you in, uh, in life? slash endurance sport in general well at uni really and um it's ironic that we have this conversation because you were very much on the scene when it started for me um i think lily your wife got a bit confused a few times at some of those local multi-sport events in those early days because uh suddenly maddie had a stunt double um (laughs) i suspect she got sort of a bit confused as to which she found more attractive at times too to be fair but um she obviously made the right decision in the end and uh i mean i was at uni i i was going to play for the highlanders i don't know if many people realize that i was definitely destined to play for the otago highlanders um you were mate yeah i was in the third or fourth string uh (laughs) university club side at the time but um yeah got a few concussions actually nasty stuff and i mean we're only talking 2004 which, you know, 15 years ago, and looking back, people, medical staff really didn't understand concussion. Mm, I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's come a long way since then. So effectively, I was left to make that decision for myself, which is a bit cringe at the moment when I think about it, because it wasn't great. I was getting knocked unconscious and uh, having trouble concentrating and lectures, and it, was, it wasn't good. And I think nowadays someone would have told me pretty early on to give up the rugby, but... Anyway, I made that decision for myself and, um, and and sort of found my way into running. I joined the Harriers Club and had a mountain bike that I'd saved up for on my uni break. So I guess I was sort of moving towards um, uh, endurance sport because I just enjoyed getting outside and getting my heart rate up, really. Yeah, awesome. I think, um, have you seen the, that movie called Concussion? I think I have. Is that? Is that Will Smith? Like, uh, I'm not sure if it is him. It's someone like that, but it's about uh, like the American football and there's all these people sort of starting to lose their mind essentially and kill themselves and do crazy stuff because all the concussions I've had in NFL. Yeah, yeah, scary, yeah. I mean, yeah, even yeah. now, um, you know, if I'm reading something, I have to really make sure I concentrate and, you know, I come and go a bit with a book because my... Yeah, I I feel like my attention span has been compromised slightly. My wife would probably say that it's more than slightly. But um, how many concussions are we talking? Well, I had a couple in in high school, and uh, one was pretty bad. I was probably out cold for a minute or so, um, 
And then I took my first year of uni, 2003, I took off because, and again, I made this decision for myself. It was like, man, I need to give this brain a bit of a rest. Um, so then came back to rugby in 2004 and uh, got through the majority of the season okay. But I still remember my last game of rugby and um, every time I tackled someone, I'd just feel this big ringing going through my head. Um, really? Yeah, so I'd become really sensitive to any, any sort of head knock. And some of them weren't even head knocks, really. It was just my head had become, yeah, quite sensitive. So luckily, I'm so glad I had the clarity of mind, excuse the pun, to, um, to yeah, move on to other things. And, I mean, I don't regret anything now. When I look back, it's, it's the old cliche, one door closes and another one opens. And before I knew it, you know, you and I were running around Ross Creek and uh, up exploring the Silver Peaks and riding our mountain bikes on Signal Hill and... I mean, it just presented a whole new world to me that, um, you know, led to where I am today, I guess. But at, in the beginning, it was really just about getting into into the wild and just having a lot of fun. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, those uh, those early days at, uh, at uni were pretty awesome. I, my first memory of uh, of you was uh, we had this race out at Vauxhall. Like I kind of knew through um, Harriers, like you said. So we, we rolled out to this duathlon out of Vauxhall and the uh, the old local duathlons out in Dunedin used to pull a few heavy hitters. Like there was, uh, there was a, a local guy, a uh, bike shop owner, and he used to always turn up fully kitted out. And this was like a local Sunday, Sunday morning duathlon. So he's got full time trial rig, disc wheel at the back, tri spoke at the front, aero helmet, race suit, like the works. And you just sort of assume that he's going to completely smash it. <laughs> and anyway, I remember being out on the bike, and it was an out-and-back course. So I saw him come past, and I was like, man, yeah, he's, he's smashing it. And then right behind him was you on, like, I assume it was like a borrowed road bike with these <laughs> hideous clip-on aero bars and this baggy blue T-shirt, like, flapping in the wind mountain bike shoes on the <laughs> on the pedals and i'm pretty sure it's just before you're about to overtake him and take the lead of the race <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the the best part back then was i think i know who you're talking about cycle surgery kit and we were an r and r sport kit i guess um neither shop really exists now eh? so we can yeah 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 i think i think it. at that stage mate that was pre r and r sport sponsorship yeah, that maybe was so. Biking around in your baggy T-shirt and some borrowed cycle shorts, I think. Yeah, yeah, those were the days, and that was in winter too, wasn't it? We'd we'd yep. um, race at nine a.m. on a Sunday morning. It was probably yep. still ice on the road. So, <laughs> um, the good old days. Yeah, and I guess and Neil Burrow's multi sport series was another big one for you and I. Five bucks, yep. and that included the sausage and coke at the end of the race. Um, mm -hmm. And it and it helps me kind of appreciate the importance of those you know, grass level events because, you know, I, I, I talk to a few people these days and their first race they'll ever do is the coast to coast and you go, mm. well, why? You know, there's so many of these, well, there were anyway, these events that cost five bucks and you cut your teeth, you learn so much, you start to build that social circle with other multi-sporters and in so doing you learn so much and mm. um, without, yeah, without those events like you say, that duathlon series and Neil Burrow's multi-sport series, there's no way I would have gone on to become a professional athlete. Mm. Yeah, yeah, big time. It's uh, and it's a shame so many of those are disappearing. You know now. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's a whole, whole another world we could talk about as to why that is. But I guess underlying it all is our our um, approach to risk as a society now. Eh, you know, like oh, 100%. Um, Neil's races were loose. Sometimes we'd get lost. Sometimes, you know, you'd hit ice on your bike and I remember watching Jim Cotter rolling down a hill, bloody landing on his head a few times. And, um, and I think partly a lot of those smaller events have kind of died away because we all look to blame someone if something goes wrong. So, um, yep. yeah, side note. Yeah, oh, big time, mate, big time. But those were the proving grounds, weren't they? Those were the proving grounds for a young, enthusiastic Dougal Allen, like the gold rush the ghost to ghost, uh, peak to peak, mountain to mountain, and uh, those early adventure racing days. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny how it was always something to something, but um, yeah, it's it's a bit, it's it's both uh, 
you know, awesome to hear those race names read out because they arouse so many awesome memories. But also at the same time, it's a bit sad because most of those events yeah. don't even exist now. So um, exactly. I feel very lucky, you know, that you and I were involved in the sport early enough that we got to experience some of those events. Um, you know, I feel a bit bad now for some of these multi-sport athletes who are coming into the sport now and they'll never know what the St. Baffin's Ghost to Ghost was. Um, you <laughs> what know? was it? Ex- explain it to them so they can get a wee taste of uh, how glorious it was. Well, it was, um, I think it was, when was it? In March? It was a couple of weeks before Gold Rush. I think so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Something and like. it was um, it was a pretty digestible race for anyone you know i think the paddle on the um was it the blue lake yep, yep. blue lake um, st bethens i think that was maybe like 5k 6k um mountain bike ride around all those sort of old gold digging areas and and again running in the similar kind of environment finishing at the pub yep and uh you know it was always peak summer great weather um everyone was in sort of multi-sport mode because all the events were sort of in full roar um, those of us doing the gold rush were pretty motivated. It was sort of coming up towards taper time, so we were really looking to um, get a good hit out. And, uh, you know, if you and I were travelling from Dunedin to St. Bathins, and just that alone was an adventure, getting to St. Bathins, which is really in the middle of nowhere. Um, <laughs> the adventure um, started before we even uh, left the driveway. Do you remember the car wouldn't start and we had to, like, push start? Was yeah. it your green Doreen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mate, I had that under control. It was always sort of fifth time lucky with, with Doreen. But, um, yeah, we'd drive down to the rowing club and pick up our kites and try and tie them down with whatever loose bits of rope we had lying in the boot. And, uh, yeah, that was that was what it was all about for us, eh? Those are the days. Those, yeah, those were, those were the awesome days for sure, for sure. Back in those days, who was your inspiration? Well, there was probably, um, you know, I I was probably coming into the sport just slightly after some of those former legends like the Keith Murrays, Steve Gurneys, the, um, you know, Jill Westenras and Kathy Lynch, those sorts of names that I'm definitely aware of and, and now probably know a bit more about. But when when I was coming into the sport, it was the Richard Ushers and the, mm-hmm. um, you know, Gordon Walker um, they were they were going head to head in the coast to coast and the Motu Challenge and those you know Mount Cook to Christchurch, they had a real rivalry going, and uh, you know we see it we see it in tennis we see it in golf rivalries are such good um, things for any sport and and that was probably where I was coming into it. I really loved looking up to both of them because Gordy to me was like this Auckland City guy who neatly presented really um, a real thinker bit of an intellect he sort of put a real detailed approach into how he prepared for these races and then you had a real contrast with Richard Usher mm-hmm. who was this rough and rugged you know really muscly looking kind of rural looking dude who um, took a bit more brawn into the events and uh, yep. what it what it produced in terms of a spectacle was always bloody awesome so they yeah, were probably the two guys um, yeah that I really looked up to and I still remember um, going to the Octagon to watch Nathan Fave do a talk at the Rabar. Did you go to that? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, re- I remember that. Yeah, just uh, my my memory of that. He was wearing this red T-shirt, and uh, he would use his arms a lot when he was talking. And I just kept looking at his arms because he just had these muscly forearms with these veins sticking out. And uh, I just remember thinking, man, what have those arms done in their lifetime? You know. So it was a pretty cool era. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And and who now inspires you? Um, I, oh, I guess I get inspired by a lot of the people I race with and against. Um, you know, I, I train a lot with Braden Curry, and something I like about Braden is I can see um, similar values to what I sort of try and bring to sport and to life. He's a real family man, and he won't compromise on putting his family first. He... He's making a living in a sport that um, really doesn't offer too many opportunities in that regard. And, and Braden, you know, he's very self-made. He, he didn't do well at school. He was probably made to feel like he wasn't um, smart and that sort of thing. He's got dyslexia. And I just really admire how he sort of built his own um, world for himself and for his family just through chasing his dreams and taking it to the to the big names in the sport. And um you know, I, yeah. So for me nowadays, he's probably one of my bigger inspirations, which is cool because, as I say, we get to go and train together, and I get a lot out of that. 
Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And so you obviously came into the endurance world through that multi-sport adventure racing sort of pathway, and then there was the shift, uh, the shift to triathlon. And this kind of ongoing love affair with Challenge Wanaka for a while, and then a bit of a messy breakup. And <laughs> talk talk us through uh, that that shift from multi sport adventure racing through to through to triathlon, because it always used to be you know a bit of an ongoing debate: what's harder, Ironman or the coast to coast? Which athlete's better, you know, a multi sport athlete or, or a, uh, a triathlete? And you know, Richard Usher made that that shift and sort of said that he was a pretty good um, multi-sport and, an, and a triathlete, and then you sort of followed in his footsteps a little bit. Talk around that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and Braden, I guess, is another one who's done mm. the same, but yeah. we've probably all had different reasons for making that shift. And for me, it, the coast-to-coast coast was probably a big part of both the shift away from the sport and also the shift back. Um, it's funny how one event can be so influential. Um, but yeah, for me, I, I'd done the coast to coast, I think six times and, uh, you know, I'd finished second three times and then I'd finished third and I'm, I'm really driven by opportunities to be better at something. And in my mind at that stage, I was losing, um, I guess, tangible opportunities to be, be a better coast to coast athlete. Um, it wasn't as clear to me every year. Before that, I'd finish the race and gone, man, I can do this, 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 and this so much better. Um, but the last time, 2013, I finished the race, and I finished third behind Braden and Richard Usher. And uh, I thought, well, I've, um, I've kind of run out of options here. Like, I don't know how much more I could have done today. And that was quite deflating. Um, I sort of thought, well, I'm, I'm not coming back next year because I already know my heart's not in it. And uh, and I was sort of looking forward to perhaps a bit of a summer of um, not being focused on the race, you know. And and you know yourself, it, it's pretty all-consuming sort of event to to be focused on through your summer down here in New Zealand. But um, just along the way, with conversations with um, a sponsor, Cliff Bar at the time, who had an association with Challenge Wanaka, they sort of planted the seed, I guess, and said, "Why don't you do Challenge Wanaka?" Um, and because I'd lived here for, um, at that stage, a good five or six years, I'd sort of followed the race. I'd done the bike ride in a team. Um, I'd watched Richard Usher win it and break the record as effectively as a multi-sport athlete. Uh, and so I guess it had become fairly ingrained in my psyche that Challenge Wanaka looked like a cool event and something I'd like to have a crack at at some stage. Um, and so, yeah, I went into it with nothing to lose. I got married uh, about two months before the race, no less, a month before the race. And, um, mm. you know, I, I was probably a little bit blasé in my preparation because I didn't have any expectations of myself um, and, and entered as a professional athlete because that's just kind of what I thought I might as well do. There was prize money. I thought, well, if I do happen to have a good race, it would be nice to get a bit of pocket money um, and finish third. So, um, you know, exceeded expectations that I had had of myself for that race, and and that was in 2014, and basically kickstarted a a new focus as an endurance athlete in long distance triathlon. Yeah, awesome. And I guess the the big hurdle for you was uh, swimming. You did you did a fair amount of swimming in your kayaking days, but uh, <laughs> actual trying to trying to go uh, fast, you know, in the right direction when you're swimming. Um, that was a big hurdle for you, eh? And yeah. How did how did you tackle that? Because you don't you never swum very well, but now you're swimming great. Yeah, it's a lot harder to swim without a PFD on and a spray deck, which is unusual. <laughs> um, but no, I think yeah, I I was very committed. My the the advantage I guess I had was I was very committed to the process. I I wasn't really fixated on any specific outcome. I obviously wanted to become a faster swimmer, but I knew to do that I just needed to get in the water and swim and and get good advice, uh, have, you know, good oversight on my technique and obviously the sort of swimming sessions I should be doing. 
and I just went about it really. I just started to get in the pool and, and cover the miles and I think my biggest swim weeks were probably up around that 30k mark um, and I, I was probably again fortunate in a way that I had that kayak background because I already had a bit of strength and robustness through my shoulders you know for for a non-swimmer to sort of move towards 20 to 30k of swimming a week there's definitely a high risk of mm -hmm. shoulder impingements and that sort of thing but I was able to absorb that sort of miles and I guess when you yeah if you're doing um, 15 hours a week of anything or 10 to 15 hours a week of anything you'd expect to improve um, and I could only improve because I was awful. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, as you say, I sort of I went from a, a person who people knew of as a pretty crap swimmer. I was a 103 for an Ironman, which is, isn't actually that awful. But again, I was probably just benef benefiting from just strength through my shoulders from kayaking. Um, to now, you know, I've I've swum a Ironman last year in 52 minutes, so that's getting pretty close to um, you know, I could almost call myself a swimmer with a 52 minute <laughs> Ironman. Not quite, but almost. Almost. I, I guess that, I guess this is one one sort of story or aspect of your life that I've always kind of looked at and thought you do really, really well in that you always seem to go to the right people for help. You're not that, you're not afraid to go and, and get the help when it when it's needed. And yeah. then also to put in the hard work like throughout you like you know it takes 10 years to make a kind of overnight success you know i love that saying because it, it's so true and that you know i don't think you could really find a, a more hard working athlete than yourself and someone that is prepared to uh to sacrifice a, a bit as well like i always remember it, coming and visiting in Wanaka and you're like sleeping in a room with like three other people. And I mean, that was no different to your university days. Were you three, guys three boys, room? Matty. Three yeah. boys. <laughs> Just to make that clear. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And uh, and then just being you know you're happy to sort of get by on that so that you can focus on on this other stuff. And I think that's real testament to that work ethic uh, and drive and willingness to ask for help to sort of where you have moved to uh, now. Yeah, thanks, mate. I mean, um, it, and it probably never really felt like um, work as such. It was always fun, and I just enjoyed mm. it, which is why I prioritised it because. Um, with anything in life, why would you prioritise something you don't enjoy doing? Um, and so, yeah, I, I would probably sleep a couple of hours more than most of my mates did at the time, and that was probably because I was working the engine a bit harder in daylight hours, and um, because of that, I was probably slightly less social. Um, I started to realise that if I wanted to perform well, I needed to make sure I was fueling well, so I started to you know, spend less money on crap and more money on good food and that sort of thing. And at the end of the day, it was all really just targeted towards being able to get up each day and, and train well and, and, and perform well when it counted. So um, it's nice to think back, you know, at, at the decisions that I made along the way, which really were just focused on doing what I loved, um, have eventually led to, yeah, a, a pretty awesome career, I guess, in endurance sport. So following your sort of stint in triathlon after a bit of a messy breakup with uh, Challenge Wanaka in terms of Challenge Wanaka turning its back on you and uh, not giving <laughs> you the distance that it wanted anymore, uh, you sort of came back to multi-sport, which was a bit of a shock. Um, apart from that, I saw you sniffing around some kayaks and I thought, Ooh, what's this guy up to? But five years between drinks, you know, what changed, um, obviously, apart from the beer uh, or the, the sponsor of the Coast to Coast over that time to get you from that second place through to that first place? Yeah, good question. Um, I think a few things changed physically as well as psychologically for me in that time. Um, physically, while I was doing a lot of Ironman events, I was layering my endurance as I went and I was maturing, I guess, as an athlete. I'm now 33, so, you know, in 2013 when I last did the race, I was 28. 
Um, so, you know, there was a physical maturing that happened there and in any endurance sport, I guess, you can expect to um, get better with consistent training well into your 30s. Um, and psychologically, I think because I'd entered into a new world of triathlon where it is a much more global sport and therefore a lot more competitive as a professional, I, I'd become a little more battle-hardened, I guess. I'd, I'd lined up against these guys that are on the um, front of all these magazines around the world and they're a legitimate kind of heroes in, in, in the world of endurance sports. So, you know, take nothing away from multi-sport. I think um, you and I both know that uh, if it was a mainstream sport, um, the world would realise that Richard Usher was an absolute freak of a specimen. Mm. Um, he just so happened to be in a sport where people weren't taking notice. But triathlon, as I say, has a real deeper level, I guess, of those sorts of athletes. More, more Richard Ushers, effectively, on the start list. So by the time I um, felt compelled to return to the coast to coast, um, where the race had, back in those days, been one of the few times I was truly tested against tough competition, suddenly I had five years of lining up on three to four Ironman races a year and, and becoming, you know, and in so doing becoming really, I guess, conditioned to high level competition and all the stresses and, and things that go with that. So, yeah, physically and psychologically, I'd probably just um, gone to a deeper level by the time I came back to this year's race. Yeah, awesome. With, uh, like, looking at it from an outside perspective of the Coast to Coast this year and being sort of glued to the computer uh, following it all day, um, it looked like everything went relatively smooth and seemed to have a well-executed uh, game plan. But then sort of talking to you afterwards, maybe that wasn't quite the case at some stages. Just talk us through uh, the Coast to Coast, obviously a long day, um, as briefly as you, as you, as you feel uh, appropriate, uh, and just sort of touching on some of the, the key things that sort of panned out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, there's so many variables, obviously, in that race, as you know, and any of our listeners that have done the Coast to Coast will realise that you just can't get from the west coast to the east coast of the South Island without encountering a lot of obstacles along the way. Um, so to have the perfect race, I think um, no one will have ever had a perfect race through that course, and my race wasn't perfect. Um, it was a race that I'm reflecting on with a lot of pride, and I'm really stoked with how it all unfolded on the most part. But, you know, I mean, my, one of the big ones for me, which probably became more of a distraction than I should have let it become was um, my smoothie mix not working in the kayak, which it won't be the first time we've heard that before. A lot of athletes often find that with the kayak, with all these straws and things, it's hard to get everything to work well on the day. Um, but, you know, it was something I'd, I'd practiced with, obviously, in the weeks and months leading up, so it was just a bit frustrating to, to not have any access to the smoothie, which basically accounted for probably a good two-thirds of my total planned calorie intake for the kayak mm. leg. So I, I wasn't expecting to have to ration at that stage in the race. That was actually the period in the race where I really wanted to up the ante and um, and effectively make my stake for claim for the, for the overall win. And suddenly I'm sort of having to count how many sort of carbs roughly I've got on board that I can access to, to fuel me through that part of the race so that was probably one of the big ones um, and uh, having a few spills in the run but again that's not that's not unusual for people but a couple of the I you know I really wrenched my ankle which had actually been giving me grief in that um, lead up to the race anyway um, and then I had a fall where I really bent my wrist and I sort of thought well you know do that again and you might not be able to hold a paddle in your hand so yeah these are just things that at the time, probably really shake, shake you up and, and distract your mind from the job at hand a little bit. Um, but in hindsight, probably didn't need to be a major issue. And, and next time round, I'd like to think that I can be another level better with my um, ability to roll with the punches. Because as I say, it's never going to be a perfect race. So, um, But I mean, apart from those small things, um, Everything else pretty much went to plan, you know. I got in that first group on the bike. I tried to encourage people to um, do their equal share. 
I've always made no secret of the fact that if you want to be in the first bunch, then you're going to have to expect to do something. There's no free rides. And unfortunately, there were the odd athlete that thought that there was a free ride, and I tried to make it pretty clear to them that I didn't agree that that should be the case. Um, but, you know, everyone's out there for themselves, so you've got to respect that everyone's got their own game plan they're trying to stick to. Um, I tried to stay pretty level-headed in the run and um, you know I wasn't for the first hour my heart rate was too high so it took me an hour to basically say right stick to your plan or your day is going to end a lot earlier than it needs to um, and and you know eventually sort of managed to recover in the back half of the run from the early effort um, and yeah good good paddle it was pretty exciting Alex Hunt and Sam Anson and I were basically together through the gorge which is pretty exciting times mm -hmm. um halfway through alex popped two-thirds of the way through i got a bit of a gap on sam and so for that last hour it was kind of everything i'd um kind of dreamed of for years and years and years is making your way down that river and uh leading that one day race um onto the shores of uh the gorge bridge and um having that that opportunity i guess to ride for glory to what is New Brighton Beach now so that's kind of the position I found myself in and I was able to just stay in the moment and get the job done basically so yeah um, got to got to the sand at the beach and the rest is history. So when when you're going about planning a race such as the coast to coast for this example your race plan revolves around uh, just what you're going to do no matter what other people do is that the general idea um yeah to an extent it is really uh i know i've had conversations with nathan Fay before and he said um you know in the coast to coast everyone is reactive except for the winner the winner is the guy who gets proactive and, and makes things happen for himself or herself mm -hmm. um but having said that you know i was never going to be the fastest runner in the field um, and so there were times in the run where I needed to be reactive, and that's what I what I did initially because Sam Manson's such a clever guy through that run. He knows it so well, and he's also just a mountain goat. So I was reactive in the first hour. I was basically trying to latch on and follow his lines until I realised doing that, my heart rate was too high, and it was going to affect me later in the day. So, um, you know, there's times where you're trying to be reactive but above all yeah I had a plan there was some heart rate things I had in mind there was you know some tactical things I had in mind and probably for a good 90% of the day I was able to really be disciplined and, and stay to my um, you know plan strategy which obviously worked out in the end. Because that's often really hard isn't it in that everyone goes into the race with a some sort of a plan hopefully focused on their own process and what they're going to do but like it's you know even for you super experienced uh you get in there and it kind of goes out the window for a little bit and you've got to make that conscious decision well come on hold it back here um get back on the on the path on that on the plan that we sort of you know have faith in that we're going to work and we're going to trust and and work on that rather than you know chasing yeah absolutely and i think you know we're probably very biased in this regard but having a coach is such a big part of that to me that process um, because you're not having to second guess things on the day because it's not just a plan that you've developed it's a plan you've developed with your coach and your coach by that stage will know you know your strengths and weaknesses and and know what's involved in the event that you've trained for so um, I had a coach and I I was coaching athletes on the day and I just can't imagine doing that event um, without someone to basically lean on for for help around race strategy and and on the day that was the big thing for me I could I could trust that there was another set of eyes that had worked through how the race needed to be uh, executed um, mm -hmm. and I was obviously just able to continue to fall back on the trust I had in my coach and and that just made such a big difference psychologically when things didn't feel like they were going to plan I sort of thought well hang on they are because I'm sticking to the strategy that my coach and I had developed beforehand. Yes, that's, that's, yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I guess that leads us quite nicely into your training approach. First of all, how has your training approach changed 
over the years. So if you think back to those uh, early days, <coughs> excuse me, think back to those early days and how it sort of progressed and changed uh, as you matured and and things uh, and things changed. Yeah, I think I've been lucky. I've had good influences over the years. Um, I may not have always appreciated um, how lucky I've been because, you know, you get quite stuck in the day-to-day grind and sometimes you resent your coach because they've given you this horrible-looking session when you really don't feel like doing it. But, um, you know, early on, um, things were kept quite simple for me. Uh, you know, when I, when I really committed to a professional coach, it was Val Burke in 2009, and before that, I'd had some good influences like yourself, actually, that had sort of given me some good guidelines to kind of consider in my approach to training. Um, and, and early on, keeping it simple was gold, eh? Just going out, um, training, you know, aerobically for a lot of the sessions and letting my body develop um, as I went, obviously bringing intervals in, um, you know, within reason. And uh, nowadays, you know, it's, it's definitely... A, a lot more of everything because I have matured over 10 years in the sport and I can absorb more um, but I guess yeah the big difference now versus back then is I can basically work my system harder and recover faster and therefore do that more often um, had I tried to train like I do now 10 years ago I probably wouldn't be an athlete now I'd be burnt out probably rocking in a dark corner somewhere um, yeah so I think having a, a longer term view when you're new to the sport is a really good approach and again it, it's where a, a coach is such a useful investment to be honest because they can always have that bigger picture in the back of their mind and and you know for me um, without having the sort of coaches that I've had over the years, as I say, I don't, I don't think I would have had this longevity in the sport that I've been lucky to have. Yeah, your long-term sort of development and, and progression has been interesting to watch, you know, from the sidelines as well in terms of, you know, how you have been quite systematic about what you've done and very much progressed that in a very gradual manner, like it hasn't been massive, you know, changes or hasn't been sporadic in terms of chasing this thing and then chasing the, the next best thing or chasing this new thing. It's all, it's kind of just been kind of boring, to be honest, in terms of uh, just long-term consistent development. And I think that's, you know, speaks huge volume to, you know, what you've done and and the success you've had from it. Just good, hard, consistent work. Yeah, I love that word. It's probably my favourite word, consistency. And, uh, you know, consistency is king. I think, you know, as much as you can remain healthy and injury-free, um, you're always going to be moving forward. Um, and, and you know, like even now as a coach, you'll, you'll train someone, for example, for a marathon, and, you know, you get a month out and they're like, why haven't I run 42K yet? Like, how do I know I can even finish this race? And it's like, well, if you run 42K, you're not going to be able to walk for a week. It's probably better that you just keep doing those 6 to 10K runs day in, day out, and just let things accumulate. And, you know, that consistency of getting up every day and just chipping away, I think, is always going to trump any, you know, one-off performance. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, consistency is definitely key, isn't it? Absolutely. And that 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 uh, concept of the marathon and not knowing if you can do the distance or can I do the distance? Can my body get me through the distance? Like, yeah, your body can because it's kind of like a car, right? That if you've got like a long haul travel to go and do, you, you know, you're driving a couple of thousand kilometres or whatever it might be, you don't really need to think hmm, I better go and do a test run of that long drive to make sure the car can do it. You know, we make sure that the, you know, the car's in good working order, it's structurally sound, we've got air in the tyres, we've got fuel in the gas tank. And if you've ticked all those boxes and the engine's tuned and running right, then, you know, your car's going to be able to get there. And it's the same with, you know, that example of the marathon. If you've tuned up the engine through this consistent training you fueled it right, you know, you've got air in the tyres, so to speak, then on race day you're going to go out there and trust that the engine's going to run. 
Absolutely. I mean, that's a great analogy, and and you know, in a slightly different angle with that same analogy, if if I'm trying to get through the coast to coast by sticking to my race strategy, you know, you can get from one side of the country to the other, um, in in you know, in two different ways. You can do it by accelerating, decelerating, slamming on the brakes, and you'll get there, and you will have used four tanks of fuel. Um, but if you just chuck it in, you know fourth gear and just keep the revs at 2000 then just get your way to New Brighton Beach you'll probably do it on one tank of gas so um, again that that consistency the discipline to stick to your numbers and, and endurance sport is all about efficiency so um, being efficient I guess is the name of the game too. Oh big time um, now you don't go through all of these years of endurance sport without getting a few injuries um, and niggles but you surprisingly have been quite uh, I'm not going to say injury free but pretty minimal in terms of your injury and you know you're one of the endurance athletes that put a lot of focus into their strength training I would think um, and so talk us behind your philosophy of, philosophy of using strength training because it's been something you've done ever since we used to do the old core Wednesday morning core class back in uh, Unipol in Dunedin yeah, yeah, that's probably where it all started. Anna Frost as well, ultramarathon runner. She used to run similar sessions, which kind of flipped a switch, I guess, for me. Um, but, yeah, I mean, one of your um, followers, Jacob, who I've worked with a bit myself in the past from Queenstown, he commented on your post saying strength is never a weakness. Mm. Um, and I really like that. I mean, it, he's deadlifting 270 kilos, so he's probably an exception. <laughs> um, I'm not quite there. But it, it, it's so true, isn't it, that strength is never a weakness. And, and right. for me, um, you know, the coast to coast, I often say, you know, it's a strength endurance event. So everyone knows that they need endurance, but they often lose sight of the fact they also need that strength. Um, so from a performance point of view, I think being strong and, and getting yourself in, in a gym environment to shift big loads is useful. But also, as you alluded to, um, that the robustness or the resilience you can develop as an endurance athlete by getting in the gym um, is, I mean, it's, it's evidential in research everywhere you look. You know, science will tell you that if you want to be um, a consistent, and we've just talked about how important consistency is, but if you want to be consistent as an endurance athlete, well, um, you know, getting strong is probably the biggest step you can take towards that. So... I am a pretty big believer in it. I'm sort of, it'd be interesting to hear your views on it. I sort of find it's quite contradictory. A lot of the um, this, the literature, I guess, around how an endurance athlete should approach strength training, you get sort of a bit of a mix of information. Um, my belief is definitely more that uh, an endurance athlete should be focusing on slightly heavier loads and sl slightly lower rep counts. Um, because in my mind, you know, with 90 revolutions per minute, we've got endurance. We've definitely got those fibres. So um, what we're trying to do is things like improve ground reaction, uh, ground, um, you know, contact time as a runner, or or the ability to absorb surges on the bike. And so to do that, I think shifting those heavier loads in the gym is is how we go about doing that. So. Um, you know, quite a bit of information out there, and again, um, this is where I think when you're when you're looking to have advice or get a coach, you sort of want to do your research first and make sure um, you're getting the right sort of information relayed to you. But um, without going on too much of a tangent, yeah, I think um, strength is a big part of the reason that I've been able to um, stay in the sport and and not suffer too many major injuries. Yeah, it's, yes, that strength training is so important. I think a lot of people. Uh, I mean, the bodybuilding industry haven't hasn't done anything positive for uh, gym-based strength training. I think for endurance athletes, because everyone's kind of scared that they're going to, you know, become this massive Hulk, um, and that's that's one that's never going to happen because you know if you're doing all of the other endurance training, you're never going to have enough energy available to put on that type of muscle mass. Like bodybuilders that look the way they do. Is it's hard to look like that. They have to eat a lot, you know, wake up in the middle of the night and eat. They're injecting all sorts of steroids into their body as well to, you know, to get this. It, putting on muscle mass and probably losing fat mass are the two hardest things in the world to do. So it's not going to just happen overnight. 
So I think endurance athletes need to realize that they're not going to become a, a, a the amazing Hulk just by, you know, going into the gym. Um, and I always think that there's probably two two key things that you need to focus on is that that robustness, that injury resilience um, through what I call like indirect performance improvement through strength training so that you're going to improve your performance because that's what we're all sort of interested at the end of the day. How is what I'm doing going to improve my performance out there in the real world? Indirectly, you're going to improve your performance on the bike, running in the water by being able to train more because you're going to be more consistent, you're going to be less injured. And I think pretty much everyone should be doing that sort of strength training unless you're new to the sport and you don't like the gym and you're only here to enjoy being out on your bike and running and and whatever else you're going to be doing. I think everyone should be doing it if that's you. And then the second thing, as you alluded to, is that that heavy, that heavy training um, to develop that neuromuscular firing rate because, yeah, at the end of the day, you think about it, a lot of endurance events are quite neuromuscular uh, in themselves. People usually start, you know, to cramp, which is a massive neuromuscular problem. They're limited through that neuromuscular activation or, or lack of it or fatigue of the neuromuscular system. They're not fatigued because they run out of fuel usually because if you've got your fueling dialed in, it should be pretty good. And I think your strength training in the gym really wants to be the opposite of what your training looks like out in the real world. So if you think about it out on the bike or or running, you get really puffed and you get really sweaty. So your strength training wants to be the opposite of that. If you're in the gym, you shouldn't be sweaty and you shouldn't be puffing. Because if you're sweating and puffing, you're, you're training your metabolic system, which you should be doing that outdoors anyway because it's more specific and and the rest of it in the gym lift some heavy things um do some core work and and get out of there before you uh, crack into too much of a sweat and start to puff too much totally mate unless you're ryan shanks and then you're probably just you know good at everything (laughs) that is uh that is true he's basically what you described of um as you know the hulk but with endurance. He's a freak. He is. He is an absolute freak in nature. <laughs> hey, mate, just a quick note. I hope you are enjoying this interview with Dougal Allen and all of the words of wisdom that he has to share about his career and his path to become a professional athlete. Now, just touching on the strength training that we've just talked about, if you are a multi-sport athlete, you have not done strength training before, now is the perfect time to get into it. Check out the winter multi-sport training plan, which is all about training through winter to get the best results. In it, there is a introductory strength program to work on getting you into the gym to develop that indirect strength training benefits that we just talked about to improve your injury resilience and general robustness you can find that over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash ms winter for multi-sport winter plan or take a look under the training plan tabs to find it there if you are a multi-sport athlete that has a little bit more experience with strength training then I suggest you check out the Paddle Strong Strength Training Plan, which is all about strength training for kayakers, but is also extremely effective for multi-sport athletes to use. If you are a cycle-based athlete, road cyclist, or mountain biker, then check out the Ride Strong program as well. They can be found, again, over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash paddle strong or slash ride strong depending on what program you are after otherwise get over and check them out underneath the ebook tab on the website all of the links to these things and insight into them will be found over at exponentialperformancecoaching.com slash 59 for episode 59 in the show notes if you want to check those out Anyway, let's get back to the interview with Dougal. So we addressed the deadlift weight. What is what can you deadlift then? We've got to answer the questions. 
Oh, what can I deadlift? Goodness me. How heavy is one of those bars in the gym? <laughs> those that's at least twenty. Yeah, yeah. I'm now if you put some of those round black things on the end, it gets heavier. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, no, I wouldn't have a clue right now, actually, to be fair. But hopefully, I can um, come back to you with an answer on that in a few months' time when I've had oh, a mate. chance to build my way up. We'll have to confirm that you. We don't want you throwing your back out, going and doing a one RM while you're just getting back into your pre-season. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be good, would it? No, exactly. So training is obviously one part of the puzzle, and uh, the other part of the puzzle is nutrition. Well, one of the many parts of the puzzle, but one of the big parts is nutrition. So talk us through your sort of daily nutrition and what the evolution of this has been um, since smashing loaves of white bread and cream out of the supermarket dumpster um, in Dunedin <laughs> through, to, through to now. I think they've still got that investigation open, don't they, at the Dunedin Police Station, so you better keep that on the DL. Um, yeah, no, nutrition's uh, it's a funny one, and it's definitely, obviously, a pretty vast topic. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've probably experimented a few times along the way with different approaches, and I've actually just finished reading a book called Gene Eating, which I'd recommend people have a look at because it's a bit of a no-nonsense approach to, um, you know, all these diets that are out there and and how basically they're all a load of shit. But um, anyway, going back to me, the the, the big difference, I think, uh, between me as an athlete now and me as an athlete back in the earlier days is probably just that appreciation for the fact that what you eat is really important to how you train and how you perform. Um, and, and it's quite simple, really, you know, you need to eat good food, you need to eat lots of vegetables, you need to make sure you get enough protein, you need to, you know, limit your intake of sugar and, and, and crap, basically, and um, and that's what it all comes back to for me. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, I was LCHF, and I was trying to, you know, limit carbohydrate intake and improve my, um, you know, fat oxidation and, I guess, my metabolic efficiency and... Yes, that definitely worked to an extent, but in hindsight, it probably was more to do with the fact that I wasn't eating lollies and chocolate than it was LCHF per se. You know, so again, it, it really just comes back to some of that really simple stuff around making good decisions, spending, you know, half your supermarket time in the fruit and veggie place and then whip, whipping through the aisles quickly because that's usually where most of your rubbish sort of is. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot I won't eat. I'm I'm not fussy. Um, I'll eat meat and I'll eat plants and I'll you know eat dairy and that sort of thing. Um, but I guess I try and do it all in moderation, which is uh, is you know in my mind what it all comes back to. Um, anything's poisonous if you have too much of it, really. Um, and so you know what we probably learn at primary school what's good for us and what's not and uh, it's probably I'm a slow learner because here I am at 33 sort of looking back on the things I was told as a 10 year old and going oh yeah it probably does make sense so mm. no that um, sounds like uh, good common sense advice which is kind of hard to find in uh, when you talk about nutrition isn't it yeah it can be I think everyone's got their own agenda right? a lot of the people that are giving us advice on nutrition have something to sell um, and so, you know, there's, there's people I trust. I know you've done a bit with Bex Wilson, for example, and I really mm -hmm. love her approach. She, she yep. does keep it simple. She's really rounded. She knows sport, you know. So as far as sport nutrition goes, she's definitely someone I recommend my athletes go and talk to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Awesome. And so that's sort of daily nutrition. What, uh, what about race day nutrition? What are you putting down the hatch when uh, the pressure's on and you want to go fast? Yeah, oh, I mean that that's something that probably has I mean it has changed slightly and evolved over the years but also it kind of hasn't. You know, um I probably I'm pretty old school again with well I'm not old school, you know, I'm not eating ginger nuts and drinking rare like Keith Murray, but I'm I'm effectively, you know, eating gels and sports bars and yep. I'm drinking sports drink and you know, it's electrolytes and it's carbohydrate you know, if if someone tells me that carbohydrates shouldn't be their preferred fuel source on race day, then 
they need to go and talk to someone who knows what they're talking about, like Bex Wilson. So, you know, carbohydrates are my preferred fuel source on race day. Electrolytes are important. Hydration is important. And so, you know, I, I'm lucky because over the years I've developed a preference for certain brands and then the way I operate, I tend to approach a brand that I'm already using and that I like and, and everyone's different. Um, mm. For me, the brand that's always worked over all these years has been Cliff Bar, and so a few years back I sh- struck up a relationship with Cliff Bar, and, you know, I'm lucky now, you know, the coast to coast, I just had a smorgasbord of gels and blocks and bars and, um, you know, like I say, electrolyte-based sports drink and things, so it's really not all that um, uh, crazy and scientific, really. Well, I guess it is scientific if you want to call it that, but it's pretty simple at the end of the day carbohydrates are important and everything that you described there is pretty much just ginger nuts and raro isn't it at the end of the yeah, day well, the, yeah, just, just refined just a little bit yeah <laughs> yeah Keith Murray oh, was on to something mate he sure yeah I mean yeah they they knew what to do you know um so if you if you've got someone that's a young up-and-comer what's some advice for them on uh the path to take if they potentially wanted to go down the line of a professional or a semi-professional athlete in endurance sport? Well, yeah, there'd be a few things there. One, I would say be patient. Um, Endurance is accumulative, so it's built over months and years of consistency. So they're two big words that I would throw at them, be patient, be consistent. Um, and, And really just just put your head down and and focus on the process that needs to take place for you to get to those destinations that you want to arrive at along the way. Um, One thing that's probably a little bit of a bug for me when I look at some of the young um, athletes in the sport that have potential is they start to direct their attention, I think, prematurely towards building their brand, you know, setting up their Mm -hmm. social media and hashtagging all the right bloody words and um, you know, knocking on sponsors' doors and, and, you know, this is before they've actually really got some good results um, under their belt. And, you know, the advice I'd give to those sorts of people is, hang on, forget the bloody, you know, branding side of it because that will develop over time based on you focusing on training, being consistent in training and starting to perform well on race day. You know, that, that's what matters most. Um, so, yeah, don't waste your energy on all that other rubbish because it will come. And then you get to my my sort of uh, stage in the sport where you actually, it's a pain in the butt, but um, it has to be done because I'm lucky to have support from some pretty cool brands and they obviously, rightly so, they have expectations on me to, to present myself in social media and, and all the rest. But, um, I mean, like I say, that comes, it's it's a pretty cool feeling to, have, um, you know, line up at the coast to coast and have a bunch of newspapers and radio stations wanting to hear your comments on the race. You sort of go, well, people are actually interested in, in what I do here. But that was ne- never something I went out looking for myself. It, it came mm-hmm. because I was just focused on, on getting the job done and training and on race day. And I guess that sort of leads nicely into what are some of the challenges of being a professional athlete in terms of, you know, your paycheck being determined on, uh, you know, how you wake up in the morning and feel on on a specific day. Can't call on sick and still get your paycheck. No, that's right. It's um, you live and die by the sword, really. And 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 what hasn't changed over all these years is that I really enjoy what I'm doing, and and thank God I do because uh, if I was doing it for the money, I I would have quit a long time ago. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. We can all sit around with our bottom lips out, or we can just get on with it and 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 focus on the fact that we're doing something we love. Um, you know, and and it is a sport that won't won't in its own right supplement the mortgage um you've got to be pretty creative at the same time and you know me me as a professional athlete i'm actually you know a few things i'm a coach and and i've got a few brands that support me that i'm able to um to basically act as a retailer in my ambassador role so there's an income stream there and you know i've just been i guess 
I've tried to be quite clever and, and thoughtful about how I'm, um, you know, making this sport viable as, as an athlete, but also as those other sort of, with those other hats that I wear. Um, and so that's one of the big challenges, as you say, you know, um, making it financially viable. Um, yeah, another, I guess, big challenge is the rate that the sport's evolving. It's becoming, you know, while there's not a great deal of money going around, at the same time to make it even tougher, the number of classy athletes has just mm. grown so quickly in the last decade. So getting results is harder than it's ever been as well. So it, it, is, it is diluting, I guess, a lot um, the opportunities that are presented to a professional endurance athlete. So yeah, you just got to be a bit clever about um, what you're trying to achieve in the sport and how you're trying to achieve it. And, um, you know, at some stage I'll have enough and I'll hang up, hang up the boots or, you know, hang up the bike as the case may be. And um, I'd like to think that I've sort of set things in place so that when I am no longer Diggle Allen, the professional athlete, um, you know, I've got other things that I'm able to fall back on to feed the kids. Mm. You no doubt you've heard the, the saying that if you make your passion your job, then you'll never work a day in your life. Or if you make your passion your job, then you'll probably lose passion for your passion because it's your job. Yeah. Are there uh, no doubt there's days when you know you that is the that is the case that your passion has become your job and it is hard. Um, how do you deal with those times if if they do occur? Yeah, oh yeah, they hundred percent occur. Let's make no secret of the fact that there's sessions I just don't want to do, and every now and again I just don't do them. Um, you know, that, that that's not a not consistently though, not consistently not doing them. Exactly, <laughs> it is a rarity that I actually just don't do a session. Um, but one of the things, and I, I often say this to people around me too that that can sort of get me through those times is just that why I really like to at times like that just uh, focus internally and really look for that deeper meaning as to why I'm in the situation where I do have to get on my bike and and go out into the cold and ride for four hours and and usually by looking for that that real um, I guess reason or that why for why I'm in a situation where I need to do this um, I, I find a lot of inspiration, I guess, and, and there's a, you know, at the end of the day, it's not actually about winning a gold medal, it's actually more about, um, you know, who I present to my kids as, as a father, and, you know, where I've come from um, in sport and in life, and all these, yeah, um, quite deep, I guess, uh, sort of reasons for doing what I do, and, mm -hmm. and before I know it, I'm on my bike, freezing my tits off, and going, thank God, I got underway i feel a bit better now <laughs> yeah that is that is very true i remember working um when i used to work for bike new Z, biking z now cycling new zealand with our with our track program i always remember there was a guy down there who uh described the uh, life of a professional cyclist as like a coal miner wearing lycra and i guess that kind of sums it up pretty much is that you just work like a dog in all sorts of weather conditions, pushing yourself to the absolute extreme, essentially just a coal miner or a gold miner because you're just looking for gold, uh, gold medals. But, um, yeah, just a, just a miner in Lycra. Yeah, yeah. And, and to make it even more of a um, gamble, sometimes you're mining in completely the wrong direction and you don't actually hit gold <laughs> at all. So, you know, it's the risk we take. It is. I think there's a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of thoughts around, you know, professional athletes, how lucky they are, or oh, they, you know, they don't work, they, all this other, and, and you know, to be fair, that you do spend a lot of time doing things that other people would love to be going and doing, but it's not always uh, sunshine and rainbows, is it? Nah, uh, it often is in Central Otago, mate. It's well, that is true. Pretty good. <laughs> but, um, nah, there's, there's a reality to it all as well and and I guess that's where you've got to really have the right uh, rationale behind coming into the sport and trying to make it a profession for those that that do have those aspirations to be professional in the sport you know um, the coast to coast again this the summer I guess I never thought of it this way but going into the race I was either going to be um, looking back on the summer as being 20 bucks an hour for my training time or it was going to be 20 cents an hour depending on how I 
you know, if I finished first or second, basically, and, you know, if I'd finished further down, it, I would have had a summer of working for free, volunteering in the sport <laughs> of tri- uh, motorsports. So you don't look at, well, I don't look at it that way, um, but I guess that's the reality of it too. It's mm. a bit of a gamble and you live and die by the sword, as I say, but um, I wouldn't have it any other way. You're a long time retired, Matty, and uh, at some stage when all is said and done, I, I want to look back with no regrets. Well, well said. Um, so I guess that kind of brings us to the nice closing uh, of the interview anyway. Um, and I just wanted to give you this opportunity to sort of tell people where they can find you in terms of um, more about you as an athlete, but also as a coach as well. Yeah, I mean, my website's www.dougallwellen.com. Nice and easy. That's got a bit of information on it on both Dougal the athlete and Dougal the coach. Um, and and probably in terms of social media where I'm, I'm more active, I guess, is through Instagram. And uh, I think my handle on Instagram is all lowercase, Dougal underscore Allen. Um, and yeah, they're probably the two, the two main areas to find out a bit more. And obviously, appreciate um, you asking. And and if anyone wants to get in touch, then I'll welcome their um, their contact. What bike are we riding at the moment? I'm on a Felt IA uh, TT bike and a Felt Doctrine hardtail mountain bike, which is probably going to punish me around Lake Howie next weekend. <laughs> Guaranteed um, to punish you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah, biking's always sort of been my favourite sport, so riding a nice branded felt bike's a um, bit of a pleasure, to be honest. Mm, yeah, they do look like a nice wee ride, that's for sure. Did you ever think about uh, pursuing cycling? Because you are obviously an absolute workhorse on the bike, uh, huge number of course records and... Um, you know, stage records for uh, triathlon and multi-sport in the bike leg itself. Did you ever think about going uh, just following that biking path? No, I, I don't think I ever gave it serious consideration. I flirted at times in the back of my mind with the idea, and, and when I was coached by Val Burke, she was pretty encouraging of me um, pursuing it. She was willing to support that, that shift if I so chose, but... Um, again, I think when I came into the sport, I, my dream was to um, use sport as a way to travel and see the world. I, I, at university, I'd never left New Zealand, so I was 21, 22 before I um, jumped on a big bird and flew to Australia, and that was the first time I used a passport. <laughs> um, and, and I was getting that through sport. I was going to China and doing adventure races. Mm. Um, you know, I was going to... Abu Dhabi, Brazil, some pretty cool countries. Um, you know, the UK and the US have never really appealed to me. I, I really like going places that I don't know a lot about and that don't show up on the TV screen most days. So, you know, to, to shift to cycling, I think, um, you know, there may have been some opportunities and some other doors open, but at the end of the day, I was actually already achieving the things I wanted to in sport. And, and to me, if I was already achieving the things I wanted to in sport and I was able to do lots of different sports um, with lots of variety, then I was probably going to stick with it a lot longer than if I'd shifted mm. just to cycling and it, I had to just get on a bike every day because I love running, I love kayaking, I actually really love swimming. You know, adventure racing has abseiling and caving and rafting and, yeah, so I'm living the dream, really, by doing what I did. Mate, that comes back to that short attention span, eh? <laughs> yeah, exactly, mate. I'm good for, you know, a couple of hours in one discipline and then I need a change. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's fantastic. Hey, thanks so much for your time. And um, I think we need to do it again. I think we're just scratching the surface and there's a lot more... Uh, detail we could dig into around a lot of different subjects which i think would be uh really cool yeah mate pleasure and and thanks for having me on board of you know i've been listening to this podcast and waiting for that time where maddie might mention getting do well and on to chew the fat because we're chewing the fat most days anyway it's just nice to do it over skype so other people can hear all the rubbish that we talk together so thanks very much Hey man, it's an absolute pleasure and an absolute honour to have the man himself uh, who lives just down the road but we're uh, 
doing it over Skype so we can get the audio a little hey, better because I'm not <laughs> literally out the window because I'm not set up for a uh, face-to-face interview in the real world yet. But uh, that's good, mate. Well, I'll let you get on with your day, and we will talk to you later. Sounds good, mate. Cheers. Done. Mate, thanks for listening. If you would like to support this podcast and see it continue into the future, you can do so in a number of ways. Firstly, make sure you subscribe to this channel on whatever platform you are listening. Like and share the podcast on social media to help spread the word. If you're feeling really generous, head over and leave a review and a rating over on iTunes. This helps spread the word and develop the podcast. Make sure you check out the range of t-shirts we have over at the Exponential Performance Podcast store. And this includes the Harden Up t-shirts. All the profits from these will go straight back into the podcast directly to help the production of it. All of this will help the podcast continue long into the future so we can keep bringing you the information you need to train hard, but most importantly, train smart. We'll talk to you next week.